So you like Molly Plata? I did. I thought that was great. In fact, I was going to go into it. Good. Yeah, I was going to go into it, and I was like, no, nah, that's a little too heavy for this. So, all right, cool. Somebody pull out your phone and make sure that this is this is casting. All right, guys. Hey, how y'all doing out there in Facebook land? I know you guys kind of maybe heard part of that conversation, uh, but that's all right. We are uh, we are live. We are back in house here at Tanglewood Church. So if you didn't catch my video earlier, we are meeting in person now uh, Sundays at six o'clock. But if you prefer the online thing and you guys have been tuning in uh, on that, then just you know keep doing it that way. That's fine too. But we'll uh, as we always do, we'll give it a few minutes, get some people logged in here, make sure everything's cool. I got Zach, I got David over here checking on the feed. Uh, if you can hear me, if you can see me, you know, make sure you comment. And let me know that. Again, we've been fighting some technical issues, but I think we got those sorted out. Uh, Cliff, can you hear me and see me? Okay. <laughs> Cliff's sitting here on the couch, so, you know. I'm having trouble with your phone, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. All right. Cool. Cool. It looks like everything's coming through good. Yeah, one person watching. Yeah, you. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, I can't. I, I think there is some way to do that, but I don't know. I know uh, on mine it showed it like two or three people and you hear your name and off like 10. I'm like, yeah, yeah, because people are commenting, you know, so I don't think that that live counter is always accurate because somebody will comment, you know, hey, like I can hear you, but I won't see him pop up on that part. So I'm not sure what that's about, but that's okay. Hopefully somebody out there will gain something from this. All right, cool. Well, guys, I'm glad to have you all back here in house. I'm glad to have you guys all back watching online. And this is a brand new lesson. Uh, I did promise that to you that I would stop recycling lessons once we got all this kind of straightened out. We started rolling, uh, rolling again. And this this is your new one. So hopefully you guys will enjoy it. I hope you guys will enjoy it because this is something that was asked for, you know, specifically. And uh, and hopefully you know you'll gain something from it. So I called this one known good, right? And I got a picture of this uh, hot rod E36 right here. Uh, BMWs are not always good, but when they are good, they're really really good, right? So, uh, this is this is probably one of the things I enjoy most, you know. And you guys have heard me talk before about you know doing diag work and electrical diagnosis and drivability diagnosis and that kind of thing. And that's a lot of what this is. And I called it known good because a lot of times uh, what we need to do is compare something to a known good. And in the automotive world, that can be a little tough. You know, you you've got service information, you've got technical manuals, you've got other information that you can find, and you can see what it's supposed to look like. Uh, and compare what you're seeing compared to that. But in our personal life, in our spiritual life, the known good is really, really easy. Anybody want to guess who our known good is? Who we should compare? Oh. That's a good one. Jesus. Jesus, yes. Jesus is our known good. So if we're ever in a position that, uh, you know, we don't know, we're not sure, we, you know, we're seeing some things and we're like, is this good? Is this not good? Well, we can compare it to our known good, which is Jesus. And that way it gives you a good idea of whether or not you're going in the right direction. With that being said, I found this on Facebook earlier this week, and I thought this was hilarious. So I shared it on Facebook. Some of you guys might have seen it on that, but if you hadn't, this is a true story. <laughs> so this is a modern vehicle electronics. This is the actual wiring, and I think this is either a Porsche or a Volkswagen. I'm not sure what vehicle that is, um, but this is an actual illustration of the wiring harnesses in a modern car. Um, and it says, yeah, I'm sure your mechanic can fix it cheaper. And that's something that I run into a lot as a professional technician. Uh, but this is also something that I want you to keep in mind when it comes to your car. Because, you know, before you start stabbing at it and, uh, you know, poking things and poking wires and cutting into panels, keep this in mind. This is what's behind all those panels and all those, those things that you might be stabbing at. So I thought that was a really good illustration of that. Cool. All right, diagnostic strategy. So, again, I don't expect everybody in this room uh, or everybody watching online to be a professional technician. That's not the goal of this of this class. Uh, this is not you know that's not what this is for. But what I do hope is that it help you understand a little bit more when you are having a problem with your car or when you are talking to a professional technician. Uh, maybe you guys can talk on a level that you understand each other. And this is generally you know every professional te tech has their own diagnostic strategy. This is what I like and this is the way I do it. So, you know, if you got a different way or a better way, I'm all ears. But this is the way I've been doing it for a long time. And I'm hoping to relay this to you so that, uh, you know, you can maybe give your technician or give your, your personal mechanic a little bit better idea of what it is that you're looking for. So diagnostic strategy. 
What is it supposed to do? What is it not doing? And what is it doing that it shouldn't? So if you've got a problem with your car, almost always, you know, it can, it can be boiled down into this, right? What is, it, what is it supposed to do? Well, the headlights are supposed to come on by themselves, or the AC is supposed to change to cold when I turn this knob, or it's supposed to start when I turn the key or push the button. Uh, so it's sometimes really easy to tell what it's supposed to do, and sometimes it's not, because some of these systems in these cars are hidden, and you, you know, it takes special tools and things to know what they're exactly supposed to do. But bottom line is, what is it doing? Is it not starting? Is the AC not coming on? Is it, you know, uh, is it turning the lights on by itself or something like that? Is the door locks freaking out or whatever? And what is it doing that it shouldn't? You know, again, that kind of goes into that. You ever had a car where the dome lights stay on? You know, that's doing something that it shouldn't. Or, uh, you know, I've had cars before where you turn the key off and they stay running. Uh, they, that's another thing that it's doing that it shouldn't. So usually we can boil it down into one of these three categories. But this is also our spiritual tie-in for tonight, uh, because what we're going to do is look at what are we supposed to do, what are we not doing, and what are we doing that we shouldn't. And uh, and so that's going to be be our verses for tonight. So, hey Blake, Ronnie, see you guys on there. Good, good, good. Let me know if uh, you have any trouble, you know, hearing me or seeing this. But on my end, that looks really good. So I think we're okay. I did change some of the fonts and colors and stuff to try and make it show up on the screen a little bit better too. So you guys are probably getting blinded. <laughs> uh, so under the heading of what are we supposed to be doing? Uh, you know, obviously in the Bible there's a lot of things that we should be doing and there's a lot of, you know, commandments and there's a lot of things that, that you know, you read about, especially in the Old Testament, there's a whole bunch of laws and things like that. But I thought it was boiled down best by a very, very famous verse and one that all of you probably know. Matthew 22, 37 through 39 says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, again, I think this is something that we're all familiar with, right? We've all, we've all heard this. But that is a perfect example of what we are supposed to be doing. Uh, you know, Jesus says it right here. This is the first and greatest commandment. So if you're doing that, then you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and that's tough sometimes. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. That's a tough one. Um, and, you know, love your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. That should be easy, but, that you know, that doesn't come easy all the time. So uh, that's, that's one of those. So what are we not doing? This is a very short and sweet verse, and I thought this would fit really well. James 4.17 If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. So again, there's a lot of things in the Bible that you could say you're not supposed to do or, you know, there's a lot of do's and don'ts and laws and that sort of things. I'm sure you could pick them out, you know, better than I could. Uh, but boiling it down all, you know, to what we're not doing is knowing what's good and not doing it. Right? I think we could all say that's that's fair, um, because you know we all mess up, we all we all make mistakes, we all have things that are that, that you know maybe uh, maybe we shouldn't shouldn't delve into. But the bottom line is, if you know what's good and you don't do it, that is sin. And so I think that really kind of boiled it down really good on what we're not doing. And then what are we doing that we shouldn't? So this is a little bit different. So in the other verse, I said, what are we not doing? Right, and so we're not doing something good that we know is that we should be. Well, this one is a little bit longer, and I, fa I, I think Pastor actually used this verse in either yesterday or uh, today's or last week's sermon. I don't remember, but I thought this really hit home for me. So Romans 1, 29 through thirty-two. Bear with me; it's a little bit long, but I really think it kind of gets the point across. So they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. That can be me most of the time, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. Uh, <laughs> I'm working on it. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. <clears throat> they have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy, although they know God's righteousness, decree that those who do such things deserve death. They do not only continue to do these things, but also approve of those who practice them. So I put this under the heading, what are we doing that we shouldn't? 
all of these things. And at one point or another, we're probably guilty of one or more or all of everything that was just listed in there. Deceit, malice, arrogant, boastful, not obeying your parents, uh, no love, no mercy, knowing that you deserve death, but, but continuing to do it anyway, and not only that, but approving of you know other people that do. So that's one of those things that we are doing that we should. So that's why I put that under that head. So I thought that was, does that make sense to you guys? You follow me? You good? All right. You guys out there, y'all following? That's all right, though, Zach, because he not only continues to do these things, but he proves of those who practice them. So, you know, he's, he's down there with you. <laughs> uh, so Jesus, our known good. So like I talked about in the beginning, you know, we usually like to compare things to a known good, you know, a signal, a voltage, a uh, you know, some sort of data we usually compare it to a known good. Well, Jesus is our known good. That's our example. That's what we need to be compared to, right? So there's a lot of examples in the Bible of, you know, how good Jesus is and the sovereignty of Jesus. And, and you know, you can find those all throughout the New Testament. Uh, but this one I thought was really good because I just felt like it, it really kind of hit my example um, analogy on the head. So 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23. To this... You were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So again, that kind of you know really fit my analogy really well about Jesus being an example and why he was an example. Because it says right here, he committed no sin, no deceit was found in him, and when things went completely sideways, when they were hurling insults, they were beating him, they were torturing him, they, you know, they ultimately hung him on a cross, he didn't make any threats, he didn't say I was coming back to get you or anything like that, he just said he trusted himself to him, to God, who judges justly. So he knew you know, that, that it was God's place to judge those people that were insulting him. I thought that was really good because this is Jesus we're talking about here. I mean, he could have done any number of things uh, in that moment, but he did. And so I think that's why he should be our example. He should be our known good. So keep that in mind. If you're ever a little bit unsure, if you're not 100% positive, what you're doing is maybe the right thing. Uh, you know, the old bracelets people used to wear, you know, the what would Jesus do bracelets. Uh, that really, really does kind of, kind of play in here. So, all right. That being said, we'll get into our more technical side tonight. History lesson. OBD2. Who has heard of OBD2 before? Everybody? Is that fair enough? What about you, man? I mean, you were on the oscilloscope last week. I mean, you, you, did you miss this? I figured it was, it was obvious enough. I didn't even Oh, I'm right sorry. Okay, I mean, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> so, I don't know if you can see this connector and the screen there. I'm going to get out of the way. Um, but that's an OBD2 port. And history lesson on OBD2. OBD1, or Onboard Diagnostics 1, can be traced back to 1988 when the California Air Research Board, or CARB, mandated that all new vehicles be equipped with a system to monitor vehicle emissions and alert to failures. So if you ever had a car that was older than 1996, and I just had a total flip out of my deal here, so hopefully that comes back. Um, if you've had a car older than 1996, it usually had some sort of diagnostic port, right? You know, if it was a Nissan, it had a Nissan-specific one. If it was a Toyota, it had a Toyota-specific one. GM, Ford, everybody in OBD2, OBD1 days had their own port. It was mandated that they had to have a system so that they could monitor emissions and you get a little check engine light on if your car started to emit more than it was uh, designed to. And that's really the whole crux of this thing is to monitor emissions. Uh, you can thank California for that. So. Good, thank you. <laughs> but the one nice thing that came out of it was OBD2. And the reason that was nice, especially for me, you know, as I have to deal with this every day, uh, OBD2 or Onboard Diagnostics 2 standardized the 16-pin diagnostic port we still use today in 1994. By 1999, all new vehicles sold in the U.S. were required to have this system. Most of them... Actually, all that I know of uh, were, were switched over by 96. But you started seeing early, early ones, Cadillacs and some early GMs were in 1994. Uh, but they all switched over to the standard 16-pin connector that we still use. And the reason that's good 
is because now you could have one scan tool with one plug that could talk to any car that was built post-1994 or 1996, typically. But that means, you know, if you had a BMW, an Audi, a Toyota, a Mazda, a Ford, a Chevy, or whatever, you still had this same plug. It was standardized. It was mandated by law that if it was sold in the United States, it had to have this. And so they did. But the good thing about it is they were able to use this plug for more than just emissions. So, yes, it was basically an emissions uh, thing. You know, they still had to be able to monitor emissions. They had to be able to alert the driver to a failure, uh, you know, an emissions-related failure. But the car manufacturers also started using them to talk to other modules. And, you know, we've talked a lot before about how many modules are in a car. There can be up to 30 or 40 modules in some modern cars. Uh, and so most of them talk on, you know, several networks, can high, can low, you know, different LIN networks or whatever. But they use this connector, and you can talk to all of those modules uh, off this one connector. So now when you plug in a, a scan tool in a car, if the scan tool is capable, you can look at airbag and ABS and heating and cooling modules and, you know, transmission controllers and all kinds of modules, all using this one standardized plug that every car uses. Now, that doesn't mean that every manufacturer has the same way that they do things, but at least you can access it uh, the same way. At least there's a standardized plug. You don't have to have a drawer full of different connectors and different scan tools and stuff for different cars. So, although it began as simply a way to monitor emissions on the vehicle, the OBD port has evolved to provide communications with many, if not all, modules on the vehicle. Now, there are several uh, BMWs, Mercedes, I know for a fact, they, they will have an OBD2 port and they will have a separate, uh, you know, kind of manufacturer-specific port if you want to talk to some other things, you know. But most all cars will use that one port for, for all of the modules in the car. So if you ever had, you know, go get, you get your check engine light and you also have an airbag light and you also have, you know, ABS light is on or traction control or whatever the case is, you can use this one standardized port, which makes life a lot easier for me. So let's talk about that. <clears throat> so what are we doing with that port? We're scanning for codes, right? Anybody here ever had check engine light on in a car? Yeah, there we go. Not just Drew. Not this time. <laughs> but diagnostic trouble codes are DTC. So you get check engine light pops on your car, you know, but you're driving down the road and you're like, eh, it feels fine. You know, nothing's changed. I don't hear any funny noises. I don't feel it doing anything weird. I don't, you know, smell anything burning or whatever. But there's obviously something going on, right? I mean, it, it, it turned that light on for a reason. Well, what we want to know is we want to know why the light's on. We want to know what the failure was or is. And we do that with, with diagnostic trouble codes. And one nice thing that OBD2 did was it standardized a, a pretty good portion of the codes. Now, granted, there are still lots and lots of manufacturer-specific codes out there. Uh, that one car will use and the other car won't, but OBD2 specifically has a list that all cars have to be able to produce these certain codes. Uh, and those codes can be broken down into four categories and all the every time the code will be prefaced with one of these letters. So broken down into, separate, into a series of one of these four letters, B, P, C, and U, followed by a four-digit number. So B, easy enough, is body codes generally concerning systems inside the passenger compartment involving comfort, convenience, safety. Examples include air conditioning, power windows, airbags, you know, that kind of thing. Displays, you know, your instrument clusters and your digital displays are usually on that, on that uh, network. C, or chassis codes, concerning systems not directly powertrain related, though generally outside of the passenger compartment, like suspension systems, angle lock brakes, and electric steering systems. Um, you, your, your wife's got a pretty modern car. Has it got electric power steering? Do you know? A lot of, a lot of, a lot of newer GMs do. Um, a lot of cars are going to electric power steering now, so it's a whole separate module and a whole separate system with its own set of, well, I say problems, but it's a whole, it's a whole different deal. <laughs> they just feel funny to me. I don't know. If any of you guys out there, you know, drove, driven a car with electric power steering, you know, what'd you think of it? Uh, powertrain codes, P, again, that's pretty straightforward. Dealing with powertrain systems, including engine management, emission systems, and transmission controls. So basically, if it involves you know the running of the vehicle, or making it move, uh, you usually see it in P codes, and that's the most common one that we deal with. Uh, the P and B. You're granted, you see some chassis codes at every now and then, especially with you know electronic suspension systems and that kind of thing, uh, and analog brake codes. You know, you get wheel speed sensors that flake out. You'll get C codes, but for the most part, these two are the most common. Those are the two that we see a lot of. And then U codes are less common, but uh, again, if you're doing it professionally, if you're doing this all the time, you probably see a lot of these. 
to the average user, they're probably not reading them. But network or communication codes, codes concerned with module to module communications and diagnostics of the various, various networks between them. Basically all that means is that the, the network that the modules actually talk to each other on, if it sees a problem with communications, it will set a U code. And that can be really useful because if one of the modules goes down, you might see a U code in several of them, you know, lost communications with ABS, lost communications with instrument cluster, you know, lost communications with body controller, whatever the case is. And you'll see that pop up in a bunch of code, a bunch of modules that be the same one. So that kind of points you in a good direction. The bad part is when you get that pop up and you don't have any communi communications with anything, then you have a real problem. So this is a really good example. I thought that uh, kind of gives us a, a, what, it, what it means, break it down. So the code's always going to be preceded by a letter. You know, we talked about that. And then you're going to have a four-digit number. And this number actually, you know, means something. It's not just a random number. So the first digit will be a zero or a one. And that de designates a generic or standardized code. So you know how I said that there's a certain set of codes that all cars have to abide by, you know, by law? Those are the zero codes. Those are standard or generic. So that means any car built 1996 and newer with OBD2 uh, will have to be able to display these codes, you know, as an emissions thing. A 1 designates a manufacturer specific code. So you could have a P1171 and that would be specific to that vehicle. Uh, but the first digit is always going to be a 0 or 1 and that's, that's what that means. The second don't digit, or the second number I should say, third digit, designates the vehicle system with default. So it kind of points you to a system in the car. Zero is fuel and air metering emissions. So, you know, like uh, catalysts, you know, O2 sensors, that kind of thing, anything emissions related that's uh, part of the fuel and air system, uh, mass air meters, that kind of thing. One, a one right here is fuel and air metering. So basically, you know, what controls how much fuel is being injected based on how much air is entering the engine. Two is an injector circuit. Three is an ignition system misfires, so if you see coil failures, you see spark plugs, you know, causing a misfire, that kind of thing, it'll be a P03 something. Um, four is auxiliary emissions, you see that a lot with EVAP systems, so like uh, you leave your gas cap off or, you know, something like that, you get a P04, you know, P0440, P0420, whatever the case is, that's usually an auxiliary emissions, so that's emissions that are outside of the engine itself. Uh, five is speed control and idle systems, so you see that a lot with, you know, like uh, throttle body problems and things like that. Six is computer and output circuits, so if you have like a PO606 or whatever, that's usually an internal computer fault. And seven is transmission systems, so PO7 whatever would generally mean there's something wrong with the transmission. PO700, PO707, something like that. And then the last two digits, the fourth and fifth, are the exact failure being reported. It could be any number from 00 to 99, and this is what gives us the specific area or component to investigate. So these, I don't know exactly where they get the 71 from. You know, P0171 is always a lean code. Every car, 1996 and newer, P0171 is going to be a lean code. Uh, again, that kind of falls into that standardization we were talking about earlier. Why it's 71, I don't know. I'm sure somebody out there probably does. But the three that we need to be concerned with are these three. So that would give us you know, what area of the car, powertrain, uh, chassis, body, is it a standardized code or is it vehicle specific? What section of the car are we talking about here? Fuel and air, ignition, auxiliary emissions, speed control, that kind of thing. And then the actual specific code right there will be the one that actually uh, kind of tells us exactly what's going on. Now I want to stop right here because who here has ever taken your car to like a AutoZone or an O'Reilly or anything like that and they offer free code scanning? Yeah. That is the bane of my existence. <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is because you see how complex this is. And P0171, yes, it will read as lean bank one. Well, why? Why is it lean? And that's the part that they can't tell you. They can tell you that your car has a P0171 in it, but what they can't tell you is why. And the, what really irks me is that sometimes they'll try. Uh, you know, P0171, you need to buy a mass air meter, or you need to buy an oxygen sensor, or you need to buy a throttle body, or whatever the case is. And without doing any real diagnostic work, uh, which we're going to get into in just a minute, uh, using actual data, comparing to known goods, you know, that kind of thing, uh, you have no way of knowing that. Because all the car is telling you 
is that there is excess of oxygen at the O2 sensor. Could it be a failed O2? Absolutely. Could it be a mass air meter? Sure. Could be low fuel pressure. It could be a vacuum leak. It could be, you know, somebody left the lid off the air cleaner, you know, when last time you had the oil change, whatever the case is. So I don't like that they try to sell parts based on this. And that, you know, and then a lot of times I'll get customers in the shop to say, hey, I had it read at a parts store. This is what they sold me. I changed it and it didn't help anything. Well, now they got to pay me to diag it and they're out money that they didn't have to be. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's one pitfall to kind of keep in mind. This is just another example. I, I included this in the handout materials. I made that last chart and then found this one. So, uh, so this, this kind of exactly what was on the last chart that we were just talking about with the uh, secondary air injection, the fuel system ignition, so on, uh, standardized code versus manufacturer specific. I just thought this was kind of a really cool way to see it, and uh, I thought it would show up good on screen, so I just included it in there. But if you download the handout materials, that will be in there. So let's talk about some common OBD2 codes. So many, many of you folks out there, if you guys can hear me, comment if any of these have, you know, have you seen them or if you've had them read before, if you, this is something you run into. These are the most common ones out there, and I'm not going to talk about every one of them, but I do want to touch on a handful. Um, so the, the most common one, these are ranked in, by percentage of occurrence. So you see that, you know, 13% of the time it's PO420 all the way down to, you know, 2% of the time it's a knock sensor. Uh, unless you drive a Chevy truck, in which case 80% of the time it's knock sensor code. <laughs> um, but what's interesting about this is that this is a really good example of where you could buy parts or be sold services that you didn't necessarily need or may not correct your problem. So PO420, catalyst system low efficiency, that one is a really common one. And all that says is that the cat is not working as well as it was designed. Most all catalytic converters nowadays have a O2 sensor pre and post cat and they can actually measure the difference and know how well that cat is working. But there's a lot of things that could affect that. A vacuum leak could affect it. A failed sensor could affect it. The cat could actually be dead. Uh, you could have it running extremely rich, extremely lean. You know, there could be any, any number of things that could set that code. So all it's telling us is that it's not as efficient as it was designed. But it's not pointing to any certain hard part. Um, another really good one, this is if you've got a Ford. If you've got a Ford, chances are you've seen a PO401, uh, especially an earlier Ford, like a 2000s, you know, mid-2000s Ranger, Taurus, or whatever. EGR, recirculation, flow insufficient. That's a really common one, too. And a lot of folks will just buy an EGR valve. They say, oh, well, the flow is in insufficient, so it must need an EGR valve. Well, the problem with that is, is that we're going to talk about data gathering in just a minute, but... What all that's saying is that it measures how much EGR flows to that engine when it's being commanded. And if it doesn't see the amount that it likes, it has set this code. But why wouldn't it see that? It could have stopped up passages. The sensor that reads the, uh, the actual flow could be dead, which if it's a Ford, it always is. Uh, the DPFE sensor, they, they die regularly and they'll set that code. And there's been many an EGR valve replaced uh, because of that. So. Does any of these up here jump out at any of you guys? Any of you seen any of them before? Cliff? 300. 300, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, where is that? Right here. Uh, um, two sensors. But I thought it was a uh, one, was it a 150 one or something like that? What, a 150? Yeah, that's usually a circuit code. Yeah, 155 or 151. But a lot of people replace O2s for the 171, which is a mistake. That's almost always a vacuum leak, actually. But I have seen it, you know, low fuel pressure and stuff cause that before, too. But the 300, so this is a really good one that, uh, that David just brought up. So PO300, engine misfire detected. Well, usually if it sets that code, you know it's missing. You know, you fired a car up and it, tick, 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 tick. you tried to go all down the road, you could feel it misfiring, and it just set a 300. But it's nothing in there that says why. Is it a dead coil? Is, you know, the spark plugs, are they smoked? Does it not have any compression on that hole? Which I had a car in there last week. That was the case. They sent it to me for a misfire. And uh, the coil had been replaced. The plugs had been replaced. And I think an injector had been replaced. And it turns out that there was no, no compression on that hole. So that person just spent probably $400 or $500 uh, that did not fix their problem because there was no compression there. So that kind of goes back to what I was saying. Just because you have a PO300 doesn't necessarily mean that it's a coil or a plug, which it can be, don't get me wrong, most often it is. Uh, but it, you know, I wouldn't bet 
I wouldn't bet that kind of money on it out without doing some further research. Now PO303, 304, you know, if you get the number behind it, PO30, whatever, that's the cylinder. So PO301 would be cylinder one, PO303 would be cylinder three, and so on. That's a little more specific, so that way you can narrow it down to a certain cylinder. Uh, Fords again, you know, five fours and four sixes and coils. I mean, you should carry six or seven of them around in your glove box because that PO303 and PO304 codes are so common. Uh, they like to eat coils, but you know, what are you going to do? They sold a lot of them, so they must know something. Uh, another one that, let's see if it's up here, PO440 or 420. Um, well, that's, that vent solenoid one's Bottom pretty close. Line. Bottom left, there it is, yes. So PO440, that's another really common one. Evaporative emission system leak. Uh, you know, 455 too, both of those. So that's a large leak, that's small leak. And when they say large and small, they're usually talking in the range of 60, 50 to 60 thousandths and 20 to 30 thousandths. That's their idea of large and small. So when you're talking about a 50 thousandths leak in something, I mean, that's a very, very, very small hole, but it can detect that. Uh, and cars use different ways to do it. They can do it with you know, vacuum, they can do it with pressure. They, they know uh, if there's a leak or not. But that's another really, really common one uh, again, you left your gas cap off. It's sitting on the uh, sitting on the fuel pump down at the shell station, and your light comes on. You get a PO four fifty five. Well, you know, is it a gas cap in that case? Sure, it is. If you walk out to the car and the gas cap's still on there, then there's probably something else going on. But you know, are you going to buy a part just because you know there's a fifty thousandths leak somewhere in the system? Uh, I would hope not. You know, this is a really good example of where you would want to take it in, have somebody do an actual diagnosis on it, hook it to a smoke machine, try to find the leak. Um, but again, that's, a, that's another very, very common code that will cause check engine light to come on that you may buy parts for uh, without needing them. And I know that they've changed the law in North Carolina here now, but somebody out there watching this, it might not be the case, but now if your check engine light is on, uh, it doesn't affect your state inspection. But prior to that, if your check engine light was on for any of these reasons, uh, you would fail inspection because of emissions, because all of these things could affect the emissions also, of the car. Because we do a safety inspection in North Carolina, or Lenore County. Right. It's a safety inspection. Right. But like, let's say, maybe Raleigh or Charlotte. Yeah. Could be more of a... Emissions county. Yeah, emissions based. And when I first moved here, Lenore was an emissions county. Um, I remember having to deal with that. In fact, my first uh, first couple of years at Gold City, uh, we were doing emissions as well. Um, and the problem is, and I'll go ahead and mention this now, so you heard me say that, you know, if your light comes on, the car may drive fine and just may be producing more emissions than, uh, than it normally would or than it was designed to. And you say, well, it's driving okay, so I'm going to drive it. I get it. I do. The problem with that is, is if that light com comes on for, let's say, a large EVAP leak detected, which might, you know, produce more emissions, but it's not going to affect the way the car runs. And, you know, let's say you don't care if it produces more emissions. You keep on driving it. Well, then you get another code. Then you get an EGR flow code or a thermostat under temp or, you know, uh, fuel system lean or any of these other codes. Well, the light's not going to come on again. Once it's on, it's on. And that really, uh, that is where it really is important. If you do get a light, to have it checked and have it properly diagnosed. Uh, because if there's another problem down the line, you're not going to know it. You know, and if you run it lean for too long, you know, obviously you can do damage. If you run it rich for too long, obviously you're not going to get very good gas mileage. You can do catalyst damage, that kind of thing. And if anybody on here has ever had to buy brand new catalytic converters, you know, that's, yeah. Then you're talking about thousands, not hundreds. Yeah. So uh, if you do get a light on, you do want to have it checked out. And a lot of modern cars, you know, GMs, this is, I, mean, I love to pick on GMs. Uh, but, you know, you can actually get into a reduced power mode where, you know, it won't give you as much power, won't give you as much throttle. It'll turn the traction control light on. It will turn, you know, the vehicle stability control and all that. It can affect all of that just by setting it, uh, an engine code. So, Ain't question. there a way that... Um, Danny, I see you, buddy. You <laughs> Not an option for everybody. And I know, I think it used to be where you could turn the key on if the engine light was on, it would, like, flash... Older cars were like readers. that. Yeah, uh, Chryslers were good for that. You could turn a key on and off a certain number of times. It would flash them. Uh, old GMs, the OBD ones, you take a paper clip and you'll go across the two terminals and turn the key on and it'll flash codes. Um, I had a Lexus in the shop recently that was the same way, an old Lexus, like a 91. Uh, but those, those would do that. Volvos, that's another one I was thinking of. 
uh, but anything OBD2 will not. Um, yeah, pre-96, they, they are all like that. Like your truck is a 92? Seven. Seven, so yours is OBD2, so yeah. Uh, but the earlier ones, you can actually put a paper clip across two pins in the connector and it would flash codes at you. Uh, this is when OBD2 stepped in after that and said, okay, everybody's gotta use the same system here, you know. So like I said, and actually, this is one of those cases where the wing nuts in California got something right and actually made it a little bit easier. <laughs> Although I do think they're a little strict on it, but you know. Uh, so gathering data, you heard me talk about this uh, quite a bit earlier. So data or information is our best tool in performing quick and accurate diagnostics. Every scanning tool manufacturer generally has a different look and feel to their software, but in most cases the information will be the same. It pays to understand how your tool can display and organize data so that you can group information you need and compare it. I put that in there because you know, you could buy a $70 code reader, you know, down at O'Reilly or whatever, and it'll give you the code, PO171 or PO440 or whatever the case is. A lot of those will have even limited data, but for the most part, you're not going to have very much data that you can look at. Well, with, you know, professional level, technician level scan tools, uh, what we're looking for is we're actually looking for live data. A tool that gives me a code only helps a little bit, but a tool that gives me data, uh, we can work with that. And the reason I say understand how your tool displays, I use two different versions here. So this is the Alltel Maxis. This is what I typically use um, you know, at the shop. This is a Snap-on Modus. That's really, really common. A lot of folks out there probably have the Modus or the Solus. Uh, that's a very, very common scan tool. These two tools can show me the same information in most cases. Although well, I have had some discrepancies, but for most part, they'll show the same ones, but they do it two very different ways. Uh, the modus will usually list it left and right, and you'll have to choose what you want to graph and what you don't want to graph, and you can kind of sort the PIDs out that way. The Alltel, you got these little blue checks all the way down the side, and you can check the ones you want and uncheck the ones you don't. You can actually group them together like they've done in this example. Uh, they group the 021, 022, and the air fuel ratio all together. So you can actually see, you can see that one switching, you can see that one not switching, and you can see the air fuel ratio. So. This is a really good example of two tools that will show you the same information but do it very different ways. So just get comfortable with whichever one you are using. But again, most guys out there, most of you guys in this room uh, are, not professional, <laughs> are not professional technicians, but it still pays to understand you know, what they're looking at. So if I, the tech, come to you and I say, you know, hey Cliff, uh, I see that you don't have any switching on you know, your front O2 sensor. Uh, you know, I think it might be dead. This is what it's going to cost to fix it. Well, that may not make sense to you. You might, what do you mean you don't see it switching? You know, what are you, what are you talking about? Well, this is, you know, this is what we're talking about. This is actually looking at the data, monitoring the signals, uh, be it a voltage, be it a square wave, be it whatever kind of signal that sensor produces, uh, and being able to relay that and say, hey, this is, this is what's going on. Now, that being said, let's say, for instance, you did have a O2 that wasn't switching. Does that mean that it's dead? No. You know, it could not be switching because it actually is running lean. Maybe that bank has a misfire. Maybe, uh, maybe there's a wire rubbed through on the drive shaft. Maybe the heater fuse is blown for that O2. Or maybe there's an exhaust leak. Or, you know, there's any number of things that would cause that O2 to not switch. So this is where data comes in really handy because now you can take and compare it to the other data that you want to see and see if there's any, uh, any reason that this thing might be acting the way that it is. So that's one of those examples where you wouldn't want to just get the code read and say, oh, it's an O2 code, put an O2 in it. Because uh, some of these modern ones, especially you know, newer cars, they use wideband O2s uh, or air fuel ratio sensors or lambda sensors, however how you want to word it. Uh, and they can be very, very expensive. I mean, you can be talking a couple of hundred dollars per sensor and the car had four or five or even six of them. Um, so yeah, you can, you can spend a lot of money uh, chasing your tail doing that. So speaking of sensors, good segue. <laughs> so the sensor is the input in the car right if we're talking about inputs and outputs so most automotive sensors can be broken down into two wire or three wire types the two wire type sensors are usually resistive meaning they change their resistance when something acts upon them such as temperature that's the most common kind of two wire sensor that you're going to see is air temperature or cooling temperature and this is a really simple schematic of what we're talking about here so we've got a wire coming from the computer to the sensor. You can see this is a variable resistor. If you were in uh, last week's class, you remember this from our schematics, uh, schematics lesson. And then we have a sensor ground. 
So what's happening here is that the, the PCM is actually sending a voltage out on this line and measuring resistance to ground. So you actually see that vary as the resistance changes. And as it gets hotter, it'll go one way. As it gets colder, it'll go the other way. And the PCM can use that amount of resistance to ground to actually know how hot or cold, you know, engine or intake air temperature or whatever the case is. But that's a simple explanation of a two-wire sensor. And that's, you know, you see that a lot on temperature stuff, but it's becoming less and less common than the three-wire type, which is really blurry, but that's okay. So three-wire sensors con consist of a reference voltage provided from the module, usually five volts, but it can be more, uh, and a low reference or sensor ground, along with a signal wire. These sensors can produce varying voltage or signals, such as square waves, back to the module. So it works very similarly to, you know, than the other one. So this is our throttle position sensor here. You see we've got ground, we've got PCM ground, which actually you know, is grounding inside of the, the computer. And then you've got a, a reference voltage, which is blurry, you can't tell. And there's our, our symbol again, if you remember from last week, there's our resistor symbol. So as you move the throttle, it changes the resistance of this wire to ground. But what you're reading is a voltage divider. So if that's five volts and you go to the middle of it, that's two and a half back there. And if you're all the way on this side, that's one volt. And if you're back this way, you've got very little resistor, that'd be more like 4.5 or 4.9. So as you go from, you know, five volts or one volt all the way to one volt or five volts, depending on which way it's wired, uh, it, that signal back to the PCM is actually what it's using as an input. The reason I say all this is because cars can't think. And we often say that, right? We often say the car decides or the car, you know, is telling you this or whatever the case, but they can't think. All they do is act upon inputs and then they act, they, they produce an output. So that's why it's really important that these things are accurate and, that you, and you have an accurate way of measuring them or reading them because if you've got false information going in, the computer may be doing everything right. You know, if that thing's stuck on four volts, you know, when it's closed throttle, well, the computer doesn't know it's closed throttle. It just sees that four volts. So it's adding fuel or adding timing or whatever it's going to do under, under those conditions. So the computer may be doing everything right, but the inputs, the information that it's receiving uh, could be false. And so that's why it's really important to be able to use that data like we talked about earlier and compare it to a known good uh, or, you know, use service information to find a known good, to actually find the description operation of the way that works. And here's a good example of outputs. So you've got all this information coming in, right? And this is a really cool illustration, I thought. Zach, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, but you know, we've got a whole bunch of inputs on this side. We've got engine speed, we've got engine temperature, mass airflow, oxygen sensor, NOx sensor, oil pressure, fuel pressure, uh, all of these inputs going into the computer. And it doesn't have to be just the engine computer. Any module in a car. You heard me say earlier that most modern cars have between 25 and 35 modules. Uh, and they are all using various sensors. You know, suspension is using speed, and it's using ride height. Uh, it's using you know throttle input. You know, airbags are using how how heavy is the person in the passenger seat. Uh, you know, it's using all kinds of things. Uh, Zach's a really good example. You know, of using uh, radar and you know the ADOS systems, the uh, collision avoidance and lane departure and that sort of thing. It's using all kinds of sensors. But any module in the car is working the same way. It's taking a bunch of data in from various inputs, and it's producing an output of some kind. You know, some kind, sometimes that output is not used, you know, like an airbag. You know, if you don't hit anything, it doesn't produce any output. It doesn't blow the airbag out. But it's taking all that information in anyway, in the case that it sees something that says, hey, we got to trigger the airbag. So every module in the vehicle is there to monitor inputs from various sensors and switches and use that data, there's that word again, that information, to provide some output to a solenoid, actuator, lead, relay, or some other device. Automotive output devices range greatly from rapidly pulsing fuel injectors to high current loads such as cooling fans or fuel pumps. The automotive module has the capability of directly providing a path to ground such as in a lighting control module, or it can power high current devices through a relay or separate module such as in the case of a blower motor speed controller. I included that in there. It's a little wordy, I understand. Sorry for you guys out there. Uh, but what I wanted to show was that depending on the way it's wired, it can actually run everything from a very, very small LED, like in your sun visor light, 
to a very, very high current device like a blower motor or a cooling fan motor. You can run all of that, you know, out of these ECMs. Generally not directly, but it has the capability of doing that. So th this is one that has a pretty good example of some outputs. Fuel injector, uh, EGR valve, idle speed actuator, uh, ignition coil, you know, that kind of thing. I hope that makes sense about the input and output thing. Does that make sense? Yes? It made sense to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know how else to do it. So, <laughs> how about you guys out there? Does it make sense to you guys? I think we've got a couple of people hanging in there. I see some comments. So, uh, all right, <laughs> Danny, I'll see you later, man. He says the modus you have to sell your kids to make the payments. On snap on modus. Right. That's true, but I use a Maxis from Altel, and it's not a lot less. So, you know, I I get it. <laughs> All right, we're talking about modules. You know, we keep talking about modules, keep talking about modules. And there's a reason that I, I keep beating this horse. Because modules, I, I want to say generally don't fail, but that's not entirely true. I've seen a lot of module failures. But the problem is that you need to be able to prove whether it is or isn't a module failure. So in a case like we've got crash sensors, we've got a body control module, we've got an IPDM, looks like from a Nissan, uh, we've got an engine control module here, power steering, uh, transmission, we got steering column module, we got all kinds of ABS, I believe that is, or maybe that's power steering, I'm not sure. But either way, we've got all kinds of modules. And when you have a failure, when you've got a fault on a car, it's really common and really, you know, easy to say, oh, well, that module's failed, and put one in it. But that's a very expensive and sometimes impossible task because most of these modules, especially body controllers, engine computers, uh, analog brake controllers, anything to do with stability control, traction control, uh, airbags, pretty much any of them, uh, they have to be programmed with the VIN and, and, and build information from the vehicle that you're putting them in. And so that's not something that just the backyard guy can do. It's not something you're going to do in your driveway. You're not going to put a BCM in a Chevy truck and expect it to start. Although it's very, very easy to get to, and it's very, very easy to unplug the old one and plug the new one in, it's not going to work because there's no software in it for that particular truck that you're plugging it into. So before you condemn the module, what we were talking about earlier about data, you need to, look, you need to compare it to a known good. You need to be able to read the data, the inputs, and read the outputs and find out if it's receiving everything it's supposed to receive and not putting anything out or if it's missing something. And so it's really important to make sure that you... Uh, that you do your, your due diligence there and actually make sure whether or not that module has failed. Because believe me, I've seen a lot of folks replace modules for, you know, a chewed through wire or something burned on the exhaust or something like that. That's a cool picture. I think you guys saw it last week, or I think the guys that were here in person saw it last week. You guys online didn't see it. Uh, again, I keep talking about modules. I keep talking about communications and that sort of thing. This is a good example of all the modules on a car. And I don't know if you can see that online, but that is a lot of them. You guys see that pretty good? <laughs> so that's probably 30 or more modules right there. Everything, body controller, tire pressure sensors, uh, ABS, front crash sensors, uh, pa pedestrian protection unit. So this must be some kind of Mercedes or Volvo. Uh, power windows, left door, right door, navigation, car audio, uh, lights, wipers, all kinds of stuff. So... Everything is computer controlled, so I just thought that was a really cool example of that. That's another version of that. That's a schematic. <laughs> I heard that. Well, yeah, there's less on this one. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So there's sixteen on this one. So that's that's a pretty basic car. That's like a car from the mid two thousands. <laughs> but even in that car, you see, we've got. Uh, air conditioner, uh, drivers, passengers' doors, parking, uh, ABS, transmission, engine computer, airbags, GPS, radio phone, uh, VFCM, stability control. So, again, it's a really good example of how you can have a lot, a lot, a lot of modules on one thing. And the way that those modules talk to each other is the CAN line, or controller area network. <laughs> uh, so what we like to see on this, this is, uh, this is the CAN bus. So that I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail on this, but this is the right lesson for it. Module-to-module uh, -module communication. So you remember earlier in the P codes and the, and the C codes and the B codes, there was a U. That was a communications fault. So let's say that you've got a module that everything 
is coming in. All the inputs are there. Uh, it's got power. It's got ground. It's got all its sensors and all of that. But whatever that controls isn't working. The power steering isn't working, or the air conditioning doesn't come on, or whatever. Whatever the failure is, the thing that it's supposed to do that it's not doing. Um, a lot of times there can be a communications failure, and this is an oscilloscope uh, capture. Uh, I use the Altel Maxis uh, Maxiscope, but this is uh, this is from something different. I'm not sure what this one's from. It might be from a Pico scope or something. But the idea is the same. What we're seeing here is voltage, and this is extremely extremely fast. And that's why you need an oscilloscope to catch it, because usually these things are set in the microsecond range, you know, below millisecond. Uh, or you might set it for one millisecond per division. That's usually where I set it, or maybe even below that, maybe even uh, 500 microseconds per division. So you see that voltage changes that fast. It's changing that many times in a millisecond. And so this is happening extremely fast on the communications network. And this is very similar to what you see in like, you know, network communications and things too. But bottom line is these computers are sending these packets of voltage. It's spiking. Each one of these is a packet. And each computer knows how to decode that into the information that it wants. Well, the problem is that if you see one of these is flat, or you see it ramp up, or you see anything really funny on this communications line, then obviously you need to start chasing down which module is causing the failure, or is it rubbed on something, is it late on the exhaust. Uh, I had a Chevy truck sometime, one time that somebody depinned the connector and repinned the communications line in a different hole altogether. And trust me, that was fun to find. Uh, but this is a known good, and this is you know, the title of it. This is what I wanted to end on. Uh, this is a really good example of, I don't need to be able to read this and say, oh, well, that's the BCM talking to the ABS module, and they're talking about the speed of the vehicle right here. You know, I don't know that. I don't know what it is that these modules are trying to say to each other, uh, and I don't know exactly how many you know, spikes we're supposed to see in a certain amount of time. That doesn't matter to me. What I want to know is, is the signal clean? Do we have a perfectly mirrored signal, high and low. Are we seeing sharp edges? Uh, this is an example of a known good. So I can compare another one to this, and even though that this, they might be different, you know, uh, spaced apart, there might be more or less packets just depending on what's happening on the line at the time, uh, that doesn't matter to me. What I want to see is a nice, clean signal. Uh, so that's why I included this. I know it's a little bit in the weeds for what we usually deal with here. But I did want to include it because it is an example where a known good is really important. Um, and I included this in the handout materials too. So if any of you guys do get out there and start playing with this, uh, yeah, you'll have a known good to check out. Question time. Questions. Questions online. Questions in person. Are there any, um, the little cheap monitors that you can plug into mm -hmm. read your code, do they have any that's not as high? Right. You know, I get that. Be a little more affordable for the the weekend, the DIYers, or I something have, like that. I have not used one personally, but from what I understand, the brand that they sell it um, uh, is it Harbor Freight or Northern? It's Harbor Freight here, right? Yeah. Um, I've been told that they have a brand that are actually really, really capable. Um, you know, with with being you know, less than half the price, but I've never personally used one. Do you know of another one, Zach? Yeah, yeah, and everybody's software is a little bit different too. Like, I'm not a fan of the way Snap-on does it uh, versus the Altel versus the OTC. Uh, those are like the three big professional grade ones that you typically see. Uh, I know that they do have some handheld ones at like O'Reilly. Uh, we used to sell those, and they had a pretty good amount of data on them for like 250 bucks. You know, I, I don't know that you have graphing capability and you know, you know that kind of thing, but. For the amount of data you well, can see, I mean, like, because you know, on some of them, they'll like if it tells you the code, but then it'll come back and tell you. Um, it might give you a direction. Like, yeah. Yeah. Point you in a direction. Give you know, list like a couple things to check. Like, like right. I had one one time. It was the um, my um, O2 sensor. Yeah. Okay. Now, do they have anything instead of like saying okay? replace your two sensor. Right, you want to see the switching. You want to see well, the Well, yeah, I mean, like other, or you, to steer people in other directions other right. than, you know. Uh, like I said, that one that O'Reilly used, uh, it had some data on it, and 
what generally you see, and I, actually I'm glad David asked this question. I, if I got anybody with me still, uh, you know, feel free to, to post a question. But also, this is really good information. So usually when you see the lower priced scan tools, you know, in the beginning of this we talked about the standardized or uh, generic codes. Though that's where that's gonna gonna really shine because it, it's standardized. All cars have to use it. All cars have to use those codes. All cars have to use that data, and anything you know under that heading you'll be able to see with that scan tool. I think where it really becomes effective having an upper end or a high end scan tool is for the stuff that you can't see that's not standardized. So let's say GMs have you know a specific set of codes that only they use or BMWs have a specific set that only they use and you know Fords are really good to not give you misfire data but GMs will give you misfire data. So, you know, if you have a misfire, you can look at it with GM and say, oh, I see cylinder number four has 2,000 occurrences. With Fords, it's not that way. It's a little bit harder. And I know the internet is blowing up. You can use mode six to find misfire data on a Ford, but we're not talking about that right now. <laughs> but there is a way to do it, but it's much more difficult. So each car will give you different information. And if you have the universal, you know, generic, quote unquote, the standardized one, uh, you'll have only the information that is standardized as manual. Now, so, do you have to update software? Yes. If you buy the handhelds from, like, say, O'Reilly's or Harbor right. Freight, do you have to update the software every year? I'll be honest, I, I don't know. I really don't. Um, you know, our scan tool at, at work, we update twice a year. Um, but again, you, I don't think you have to. I mean, you know, I'm not looking at a lot of 18, 19, and 20 vehicles. But now, what Zach does, Zach's updates every month. Is that right? And for those of you online that don't know what I'm talking about, my son Zach is a ADOS calibration technician for a body shop here in town, and uh, so he's dealing with you know 18, 19, and 20 model year cars uh, quite a bit. Uh, whereas I'm not. Usually, what I see is is you know five years old and older. Uh, but yeah, he he was just telling David that his uh, software updates sometimes every month, just depending on the brand. So. Uh, but yeah, that's a good question. Honestly, I don't know. I would I would imagine that you probably would have to. With that, um, but with that Mitchell box, it was, I think it was yearly or um, every six months or whatever, and you just paid the your subscription and it just does it by itself because it just connects it to your internet and all. Yeah, and like I said, there's deals to be had on old. Uh, high-end stuff, you know, old Moduses and, and Snap-on Soluses and that kind of thing. I mean, you can find them on the internet, find them on eBay and things like that. So maybe they wouldn't be up to date for like the newest the newest and greatest thing. But if you've got a car that's, you know, 10 or 12 years old or, or whatever, then you could probably pick up a used one pretty cheap. And even if it wasn't updated, it would still be fine for what you're dealing with. Um, that's where it really gets kind of fishy is like, you know, I do it professionally, so I need to have it updated all the time in case something comes in. But if you've got, you know, your truck, a 98, model Chevy truck, then you should be able to find one pretty pretty cheap because obviously the truck hasn't changed. So if it hasn't been updated, it's still fine. So that's a good question though. I do appreciate that. And, and truth be told, I haven't used one enough to really know. Cliff, you've been mm -hmm. quiet tonight, man. Mm -hmm. It's good to have you in good to have you in person. Any questions, comments, concerns? No. Alright, cool. What is the bottom side of them? Right here? Yep. So we're actually looking at this in reference uh, to five volts. So it's, it's kind of interesting. So you want to see two and a half <coughs> volts spread. And what's usually happening here is that it will pull one low as one goes high. So this is actually two separate wires. This is can high and can low. And you'll see can high go high. In other words, kind of be uh, off, if you want to call it that. And you'll see can low get pulled down, basically to ground. And you'll see them do this together. Um, but yeah, you'll see this would be ground and it'll pull it, it'll pull it down or, or let it go high. So all, an oscilloscope is a great tool uh, for this because you're seeing it really, it happens really, really fast. It's too fast to catch it on a voltmeter. It's too fast for anything like that. Uh, but you can actually use this like a voltmeter and if you wanted to monitor, you know, ignition coil or, or whatever, you can actually see see it when it gets pulled down and let go. So this is really good for like uh, anything like an injector or something that gets pulled down. You'll see it get pulled to ground when it's on and then you'll see it go high, you know, when it's not. Uh, but that's all it's doing is it's pulling it down or letting it go high. But yeah, usually you want to see a two and a half volt difference. So it'd be a five volts altogether. 
But everyone, you know, each car manufacturer does have a little bit different way that they do this. The signal usually looks the same, uh, but it can be a little higher or a little lower. So, and I'm not sure why that is. Well, cool. Well, it's 7.01, so it looks like I nailed it uh, time-wise. I know that there's some, uh, I know some more online church services happening at 7 o'clock, so I'm going to let you guys get over there to that. Uh, any prayer requests or anything? Uh, again, as always, uh, if you have any prayer requests that you want to send in, or if you're not comfortable with that, go to TanglewoodChurch.com. They've got a prayer team that's on, you know, on staff 24/7. They'll get your message. They'll pray for you, um, or you can send me a private message or whatever the case is. But if anybody has anything, yes. Well, now that I'm 16, I'm gonna start applying for jobs. And Amen. Start Amen. Making, start making that money. Amen to that. Right on. Well, cheer up, because it gets a lot worse. Hey! <laughs> oh, we're just teasing, man. That's good. That's really good. No, no you're not. It does get a lot worse. Yeah, yeah, it does. But you do have more money, so, I mean, I guess you can no, kind of... No, you don't. Well, that's true. No, because... That's a lot. You start making more money, you start spending more money. Yeah, you don't that's have true. to spend more money. It just, yeah, it just happens that way. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, cool. Well, I'm going to pray, guys, and then we'll get out of here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this group and thank you for this opportunity. I, uh, I pray, Father, that somebody may take something away from this message, Father. And I pray safety over everybody maybe watching this online or here in this room. I pray safety over them until we can meet again. Father, I pray that you would, uh, you would continue to be with each and every one of us as we move through this week and, uh, and use us to, to glorify you. And we do this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, guys. Thank you for watching. Uh, as always, you can check these out on YouTube after the fact and look into the link and you'll see the uh, handout materials if you want to print those out as well. All right. Like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs>